I want to begin by welcoming everyone to today's webinar, where our topic is winter tree identification, which looks like a very timely topic because we have, I believe, a record number of folks uh, uh, than we've had on previous webinars, and that's just great to see. Thank you all for signing in. My name is Neil Letson. I'm a member of the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and will be your host. And I want to mention that for our first time viewers, today's webinar is part of a monthly series that's brought to you by the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council and the U University of Tennessee's Department of Natural Resources. And representing uh, UT's Department of Natural Resources is Katie Donaldson. She is uh, handling all the technical aspects of this and quite frankly made the webinar possible uh, through those means. So thank you, Katie. This is your first time doing this on your own and uh, we appreciate you. Uh, our purpose with these webinars is to offer you as wide a range of topics that will not only deepen your understanding of the importance of trees, but we hope that it might inspire you to grow a healthy urban forest in the places where you live. So uh, before we begin, I wanna cover a few housekeeping items. I don't wanna take too much time away from our speaker. Uh, many of you will be looking for ISA CEUs, and this did qualify for one hour. CEU through a variety of categories. I don't have those listed, but uh, there are several of them. Uh, and one point I need to make, just so we will handle the submission of your attendance. Uh, you just need to sit in through the whole thing, and we'll measure that against your registration. But we're going to need a couple of things from you uh, to do that. We need to have your name and your ISA certification number. Now, if you're not sure if on your screen, if your name doesn't show up on that screen, uh, then you need and you have and you want to qualify for a CEU, you need to send us your name and your ISA certification number in the chat room. And we'll remind you again later on uh, after this presentation to do that. But we don't want to make any errors or drop the ball on you getting credit for this webinar. Uh, the second point, uh, you do have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, it'll be towards the end or after the end of Chris's presentation. And if you don't mind, as your questions come to mind, just enter those in the chat room. And after Chris's presentation, uh, Katie will read those out. And, and with the time we have allotted, uh, Chris will handle as many as he can. But we do like to do that and offer that to you uh, during each webinar. So. With no further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today. He is Chris Graves. Uh, he's an instructor and a certified wildlife biologist at the University of Tennessee's Department of Natural Resources, and he also teaches a course in dendrology. So he's well qualified to uh, give us this talk, and at this time, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Let me uh, hide this floating thing. There we go. All right, folks. Uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And, um, you know, I thought, man, you know, maybe maybe y'all saw something online that was positive about me. And, and we've got this record attendance, which is neat. But now I'm just learning that you're getting some kind of continuing education credit. So, <laughs> uh, no, um, I, I'm really looking forward to this. And actually, let me go ahead and start by saying this. But this will probably be part, part one because uh, you have to realize I teach dendrology and silvics of North American trees here at the University of Tennessee during the spring semester. We start with uh, what we call winter dendrology or winter tree identification. Uh, in that course, we meet about seven hours a week, and uh, that lasts for about 16 weeks. So it's going to be difficult for me to you know really cover all the bases that I wanted to. Uh, so I'm going to start off with... Uh, you know, really my approach uh, and what I try to teach students. And then, you know, we will look at some species in, in detail, but maybe in, if we were able to do uh, a second part of this, then we can uh, kind of circle back and cover more on uh, species ID. All right, uh, so here we go. You know, first thing, as you can see, hopefully in my slides, where am I? Well, hopefully you know where you are uh, currently, but also, you know, when you're out and about. Uh, but this is really important, especially when we think about tree ID. Uh, so if you notice, I've got a range map there. Uh, that's uh, U.S. Forest Service, Table Mountain Pine. 
It says Pinus palustris, which I just noticed. Uh, that's actually the scientific name for longleaf pine, uh, which I've worked uh, extensively with in the deep south. Uh, Table Mountain pine is Pinus pungens, but you know, let's let's move on. But you'll see though this range map. Really important to uh, to think in terms of exactly where you are and what species you might encounter. Uh, next up, you will see uh, this. This is really important to know. Uh, not only where you are, but what all has uh, taken place over the years. So University of Tennessee, we have the UT Arboretum in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, you could imagine a lot of species uh, exist there, the, some that are natural, uh, some that have been planted. So you might be looking at uh, what you would think is an American beach uh, at the UT Arboretum, and then you look at a sign that says European beach. Uh, so this, I always uh, tell students, you know, beware, be on guard when obviously when you're at an arboretum, a certified arboretum at that, uh, but also if you're at some public institution like a college campus, a public library, where folks have come in maybe through the years or over many decades and they've planted these species that may not be native, uh, you might run into cultivars or uh, varieties, uh, just a lot of unknowns I guess. I work primarily out in natural areas, wild lands, in the woods. Uh, so, you know, a lot of my focus here will be on that versus, uh, you know, dealing with, with a lot of the trees and, and woody shrubs that uh, horticulture, horticulture may deal with and plant on a regular basis and teach as part of their programs. Uh, next up, you can see, uh, this is actually the CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, planted billions of trees, three million men working during the Depression. It was known as Roosevelt's Tree Army. Uh, so a lot of that has gone on, and you might uh, encounter some of the trees that they planted uh, way back in the 1930s. Uh, and of course, you know, people are still planting trees and shrubs on a regular basis. Uh, so again, just want to emphasize that here, to stress that to always sort of uh, be on guard, be aware, you know, that, uh, you know, as far as tree ID, you know, has an area been planted? That's a pretty important question to ask. Uh, as far as land use history, this is the geographic range of longleaf pine. And uh, longleaf pine was really the tree of the South. Uh, for the most part, it covered uh, around 94 million acres from Virginia all the way down uh, into Texas along the coastal plain, but even beyond that into the sand hills and even the uh, lower mountains of Alabama. Uh, but land use history, try to learn as much as you can about the land use history so that you're better prepared to identify trees. Uh, this is a book that we use. Uh, it's called Forest Cover Types of the United States and Canada. It was produced by the Society of American Foresters. We still use it today. I was a dendrology student way back when, uh, in the 1990s. I had Dr. Ed Buckner, and this was a required book uh, even then, um, but it's, it's still relevant today, and I highly recommend you consider purchasing this book. It's pretty cheap, uh, and it's still available, I think, online. And when we get into cover types, this is important. You know, you're, you're more or less, you're doing homework here, trying to decide on you know, where you're going to be identifying trees. Where am I going to be specifically maybe on the landscape? Uh, so when we get into cover types, you can see there, uh, of course, Great Smoky Mountains National Park is a prime example. When we take students there, it's like going from Georgia to Maine or Georgia to Canada, and we get to see a wide variety of uh, plant communities or forest cover types. And, um, you know, if you do a little bit of research ahead of time, it'll help you to better identify trees, you know, in your, if you're in a place like that, that is so biodiverse. Uh, some books. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I don't know that it's still in print, but it's Forest Trees, A Guide to the, uh, a guide to the Eastern United States. Uh, it's a very good book. I've actually got it here. There it is. Okay, uh, so that that's a good one. Uh, and there are a whole lot of books, but, um, you know, here's another one uh, here. Let's see. Let me get rid of that. Yeah, Woody Plants of the Southeastern United States, a Winter Guide by Ron Lance. Uh, I've worked with Ron Lance. He is, he's a bona fide genius. Uh, if you want to look him up, uh, he's, 
got some really good books. He's a good artist, but he is a phenomenal botanist. Uh, just to brag on him a little bit, a lot of botanists didn't want to take on the hawthorns, and he has recently written a book on uh, hawthorns of the eastern United States. Very good dendrologist. Uh, and then this is maybe some of y'all's go-to. It's been around since 1970, the Winter Tree Finder, a manual for identifying deciduous trees in winter. It's by Watson Watt. Uh, Bark, now this is a fairly new book, but it's, it's a good one called Bark, a field guide to trees of the Northeast. Covers almost uh, 70 species. I don't know this gentleman, but uh, he was brave enough to try to take on the challenge to uh, teach Bark through this uh, book. And then identifying hickory and walnut trees, native to Tennessee using brief recognizable features by David Merker, who's with UT Extension. So there are a lot of extent, extension publications that are very good and very useful. And of course, there are many, many books uh, out there. And of course, now online resources and apps and other things that you can use even from your phone. Uh, but let me say this, you know, a big part of my career was working with good people. And, you know, when you surround yourself with good people, whether that's uh, just by chance based on the job you have, but, you know, one of my goals was always to identify you know, really quality people that knew what was going on. Uh, these are people that have, have educated me and taught me a lot about tree identification. So when we talk about, you know, working professionals, like a uh, somebody working as a county ranger in North Carolina, for example, or a, a silviculturist working for the U.S. Forest Service, um, maybe a professor, um, college instructor, you know, a lot of different people out there that are interested in, in winter tree identification. And, uh, you know, when you're working together, it seems, um, you know, you can almost, seems like you could conquer the world and uh, winter tree identification is not as maybe um, intimidating uh, when you have been taught by some of the best, but then also you continue to surround yourself by people that are interested in this topic area. I've been fortunate to work throughout the Southeastern United States pretty extensively. Uh, beyond that, but I've spent the bulk of my career in the Southeast. So just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm always thinking mountains, Piedmont, coastal plain, mountains, Piedmont, coastal plain. And, uh, and that's been very helpful too uh, for you know, the, the work that I do as far as uh, botanical inventories and, and of course tree identification. Uh, I recently visited a friend in Louisiana. He's a wetland scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey at LSU. And uh, just to you know, give you an idea, yes, it was just a, a, a trip over the winter break uh, around Christmas time. Uh, we were fortunate, you know, to spend time outdoors. And I, uh, I can't encourage you enough to you know plan ahead. Uh, some people plan on you know where they're going to eat lunch or dinner, and you know all the favorite uh, places to eat and, and those sort of things. Uh, but for us, you know, that are interested in this you know, plan ahead, whether it's birding and you're trying to identify a lot of birds, but in our case, what y'all seem to be more interested in uh, would be the trees and the shrubs and vines and maybe some of the herbaceous plant community as well. Uh, so this is the largest cypress uh, now on record. It's at Cat Island National Wildlife Refuge, just a giant tree, uh, but, you know, as a real treat to get to see it. Uh, and then, of course, the first thing, you know, when I pull into his driveway, we, we stayed with them. Um, and they don't live too far outside of, of Baton Rouge. I uh, don't know if y'all recognize this, but of course it is a, a conifer, right? It's a cone bearing tree. It's a maybe a pine or a spruce or something along those lines. Uh, well, this is a spruce pine. So this was in his yard and man, uh, you know, I, I got pretty excited just after we had driven in, drove up into the driveway just to see that, oh my goodness, you know, this is gonna be a good trip as far as uh, some trees that I don't get to see every day. And spruce pine is definitely one of those. So when you pinpoint, you know, where you are on the map, this is uh, where they do the, the cone counts or conelet counts um, as part of the coastal plain and longleaf pine initiative. Uh, that's the pins that you see here. But the point is, is just saying, you know, pinpoint exactly where you're going to be on the map and, and plan ahead so that you are prepared. Then I would say, this is when you really now need to do your homework. Uh, doing your homework to me is still includes, you know, books, especially good field guides. Uh, so looking at range maps, flipping through the field guide, 
and trying to make a decision on, uh, well, after you've made a decision on where you're going to go, uh, start flipping through the field guide, looking at range maps to see what naturally occurs there. That's, that's very important. I can't emphasize that enough. All right. Uh, next could be the web soil surveys. You can see down there below the range map. I'll get into some details about that. Uh, but the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, uh, which is a federal agency, they primarily work on private lands. Uh, they do a lot of farm bill program delivery, uh, but they have this awesome tool that is free and you can Google this, uh, the NRCS web soil survey, it'll come up. And uh, if you're interested more in this, I can share uh, sort of an instruction sheet on how to get to this point. Uh, but once you know where you're going to go uh, and you get to that field level view or, or that forest level sort of aerial view, then you can literally highlight the area that you're going, uh, pull up all the different soil types, which is very easy. It's just a click of a button. Uh, but when you go into the uh, vegetative productivity under that, there's forest land productivity. You click on that. And again, I have instructions for this, but the neat thing is in RCS, they have awesome soil scientists, and then they've worked with state forest uh, service agencies years ago, and they tried to make decisions on, you know, what trees would, what species of trees would naturally occur on a particular site based on this soil type. Um, and then they took it further in saying, well, these are some trees we would recommend maybe you plant and manage. Uh, so you can see both of those common trees, what might naturally occur to the, the category there, trees to manage. Um, you know, so those are those are some, uh, this is a handy tool. It's a good way to gain information on a particular site before you go go visit. And, um, and it'll give you a leg up then when you're trying to identify trees on that particular site, because there are a lot of what we call forest associates uh, that will occur with certain species of trees that may be dominant within that forest cover type. And then site conditions, uh, you can see elevation here. Uh, this is super important. Uh, we don't, uh, here at, in Tennessee, you know, our highest elevation is uh, Clingman's Dome, I guess, a little over 6,000 feet, uh, 6,600 feet or so. Um, so, you know, the species that you're gonna run into in what we call the Blue Ridge Physiographic Province, the high mountaintops in the Southern Appalachians, it's gonna be totally different than what you might find in the Central Basin of Nashville, or in the, uh, of course, uh, uh, the floodplain of the Mississippi River in West Tennessee. Uh, so knowing exactly what the site conditions are, super important, knowing the elevation uh, can also, uh, that elevation can dictate, you know, what species you might actually find on that particular site. And then getting into details as far as, um, you know, again, narrowing it down, elevation, which physiographic province am I in? And I, am I in an upland uh, situation or am I in a bottomland uh, setting here? So really important to know, you know, if you're on high dry ground or if you're in an area that, uh, you know, may be inundated with water uh, during flood events uh, where we tend to find, you know, a lot of uh, um, unique species. And then next up here, you can see the, uh, the slide, but getting into more of those details, doing your homework, knowing where you're at, but also knowing where you're standing on the landscape. Uh, so if you're on a mesic site, which is a kind of a cool, moist site, or a xeric site, a dry site, maybe a lot of sun exposure, um, you know, these things are, are very important. So when we think about north-facing slopes or north aspects, you know, we tend to have um, you know, a lot more moisture, a lot more shade, maybe richer soil on that side of the slope uh, versus a, a south facing slope. You might have very infertile soil, thin soils, rock outcrops, a lot of sun exposure, it's dry. Um, so, you know, again, these species are adapted to, uh, to thrive based on these local climatic conditions and, and soils and everything else. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm challenged with with students is teaching dendrology and really starting uh, in, in January can be intimidating um, because, you know, the deciduous trees, deciduous meaning they drop their leaves in the fall. You know, now all of a sudden you're dealing with what we call or maybe I refer to it as a bunch of naked trees. So that's intimidating, especially because most people that do dendrology, they start with leaves and maybe they don't even 
progress much further than that. Um, so, and I, I, I'll be honest with you though, uh, I like the method that we have through the, in the spring course because I think it's, I do think it's better. Uh, the students that perform well in my class, uh, you know, they can, I, the ones that do well again, uh, I have full confidence to be able to, you know, hand them tree marking paint and have them go and, and mark timber. We typically do that in the winter months. The leaves aren't on the deciduous trees. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's exciting. It's fun to walk in the woods. It's fun to make management decisions that way. Uh, but, you know, the ones, the students that start typically, you know, in the fall, like most universities, most colleges, that's when they do dendro is in the fall. Again, they start with leaves and then they're almost just caught up in trying to identify trees just using leaves alone. And, and really, uh, there's a lot of variation. You can look at the variation of just a white oak leaf, Quercus alba, and I'm telling you, uh, leaves are not the best method to identify trees, at least in my opinion, based on my experience now. So boots on the ground, that's where we're at here. Uh, those are gonna be the next steps. So we've done all our homework. Now we got boots on the ground. You know, what do you need? Uh, I highly uh, suggest that you get a good pair of binoculars also a hand lens so that you have that kind of loop magnifier or some kind of magnification so you can see details. This is uh, especially important in the winter time because a lot of times we're looking at twigs and uh, characteristics on these twigs, on these buds and stuff. That can be, you know, you, you really won't be able to see the detail that you need to see, those fine details without a magnifier. And then a pocket knife always comes in handy. Uh, you don't think much about sap odors, but sap odors can, just give away a species, whether we're talking about, you know, a yellow birch, black birch, talk about black cherry, sassafras, all these species with strong, unique sap odors, uh, the pocket knife can help with that. Plus the pocket knife can be used for other, other purposes. So we're gonna get into a little bit of this uh, terminology. Um, a twig is last season's growth. So if it's winter time, and you know, there's no leaves on these deciduous trees, right? Abscission has taken place, leaves are all laying on the ground for the most part. The twig is last season's growth. So it's gonna be fresh, it's gonna have more color uh, versus the rest of the branch. So if you look there, here's the branchlet. I don't know if y'all can see uh, this point or maybe not, uh, but this part that says branchlet, that's a two year old uh, stem. Okay, and all this, these are not sticks. This is living tissue, all right? So, so again, this is living tissue uh, that we're talking about uh, with the twig being last season's growth, a branchlet being, you know, two seasons ago, and then a branch is usually three or more years old. Some more terminology. We've got a terminal bud. Not all species have a true terminal bud. Some will have a false terminal bud or pseudo terminal bud. Uh, but here's a terminal bud, and then those uh, the buds that are along the sides of a twig are often referred to as axillary buds or lateral buds. But it's important to know the terminology because if you end up using maybe a dichotomous key, the hardest part about using a dichotomous key is the terminology. So you need to learn the terminology so that you can key things out when necessary. Uh, you can also see there's a leaf scar. So abscission has taken place. That leaf petiole then. As it, as it fell off the twig has now left a scar where it once occurred on the twig. Uh, within the leaf scar, you'll see these uh, bundle traces or bundle scars. And a lot of times there may be a certain number of those, maybe uh, shapes and, and arrangement and everything within the leaf scar. Uh, so this can be a, a very valuable thing uh, with identification. And then you can see the pith, also lenticels, real quick on lenticels, that's for gas exchange, but all this stuff, the pith, the lenticels, leaf scars, um, the colors, the, again, the smell, but the arrangement, the shapes, all this, you know, will be unique based on the species of tree that you're looking at. Uh, I think, uh, quite honestly, you know, just frankly, uh, twigs are sort of the DNA fingerprint for a tree. So if, man, if I can get my hands on a twig, uh, that, can be super, super helpful uh, because, you know, if there's a debate on whether it's this oak or that oak or this species or that species, well, let's look at that twig because, uh, you know, when you start looking at the bug, bud characteristics and everything else, uh, then you should be able to get it down to species no problem. 
A little bit more on terminology, as you can uh, see, we've got different types of buds here. Uh, so on the, the left side of your screen, I think it should be left, you can see naked bud. That does not have bud scales. A bud scale is almost like a shield or a clear shield. It may have some color to it, uh, but it protects that living tissue, next year's growth, uh, which is, you know, it's a miniature package of leaves and potentially flowers and all kinds of stuff that are inside this bud. So when these trees go dormant, these deciduous trees, they're protecting themselves from the winter months. So when they go through that dormant period, you know, where is where is next season's growth? You know, well, it starts out then with those buds. So when at bud break, we end up with all these shoots and stuff, but all that was protected uh, by bud scales most of the time. Occasionally though, and actually more, you know, so it's not rare, but some species won't have uh, bud scales. They'll have uh, they won't have any at all. They'll have a naked bud, which is, you know, next season growth sort of protected by uh, an outer layer. So we have the naked bud, a single bud scale that may cover um, things or valvate, meaning two bud scales. And then more commonly, what you'll run into would be the imbricate bud scales. So imbricate scales, meaning usually three or more bud scales uh, there on the twig with one individual bud. Uh, with, I've already mentioned a lot of these on the left, terminal bud, pseudo-terminal bud, or false terminal bud. Occasionally, you'll see a branch scar. You actually see that pretty often with your pseudo-terminal buds. And then lateral buds, but often referred to as axillary buds, depending on what book you're looking at. Uh, but then with these lateral buds over here on the right, you should be able to see the superposed buds. This is very common with things like black walnut, where you have two lateral buds that are stacked on top of each other, maybe as many as three. So they're, they're stacked on top of each other versus collateral buds. Uh, red maple is a very common one for this where you'll see those buds are kind of side by side, um, as you can see in this drawing. And then we have catkins. Catkins can be very helpful, especially with uh, Betulaceae, so river birch and uh, then you get into like alder, hazel alder, tag alder, whatever you want to call that as far as a common name. But catkins can be very helpful in identifying a tree or shrub to species. A little bit more on terminology here. So leaf arrangement, we have alternate. And that just means, uh, you know, the, the leaves, uh, they're like, alternate up the stem or up the twig, right? So they're, the arrangement is alternating. Uh, so we call that alternate uh, leaf arrangement. But in the case of winter ID, there are no leaves. So now we're looking for, you know, where are these buds positioned? So if the buds are alternately arranged, then, you know, we're starting to narrow it down to, okay, well, this is, has alternate uh, leaf arrangement, and that would help you as you key things out. This is American chestnut. Versus opposite leaf arrangement, uh, here we have uh, sugar maple. Sugar maple, the terminal bud, is one of the sharpest. I always say you could poke somebody's eye out with that. Uh, but anyhow, if you look at those lateral buds down there on that twig, notice how they come out opposite of each other. And uh, the leaf scars there that are left behind, which are under those lateral buds or axillary buds, they come up to a, a point, almost kind of V-like, uh, but upside down V or almost like a mountain peak. And um, you know that's a, a good characteristic with this one. But the main thing to, to focus on uh, is just the opposite leaf arrangement that you'll see with uh, several of the species we'll go over. Then we have whorled leaf arrangement. So now uh, you might see opposite leaf arrangement with some of these, but like in the case of uh, Catalpa speciosa, northern Catalpa, you can see the whorled arrangement of the leaf scars. Those leaf scars here look a lot like a moon crater. They're raised, but they're also sunken or, or concave and uh, those tiny little buds perched up on top, those little brown buds. The lenticels are raised. So again, you know, all this stuff can get you down to species uh, pretty quickly if you know what you're looking for, but this is whorled leaf arrangement. I've already gone over this, but you can see uh, maybe on the left side, this drawing, uh, we have a leaf. This is abscission. So the leaf falls off, let's say in, in late autumn or in the fall of the year, and then it leaves that leaf scar. And there you can see the leaf scar has three bundle scars or three bundle traces. They almost look like dots. Uh, this is really common with uh, 
uh, some species, but especially like black gum, uh, Nissa sylvatica. So that is one way you can quickly uh, get down to black gum once you have all those other twig features. This might be, uh, you know, the one thing that, that nails it down for you. Okay. And then stipules. Stipules are important to mention. A stipule is just a leafy or leaf-like uh, appendage on a twig. And as those, they're there during spring and maybe even into summer, they may even persist longer. Uh, but typically spring and summer is when you would see uh, stipules, these leafy appendages growing on twigs. But once they fall off, once abscission occurs, they will leave a scar. And that can be very helpful in identifying things to species. Then we get into to the pith. So um, you need a pocket knife for this and a sharp one at that. Uh, so a solid pith would be a homogeneous diaphragm. I say shelves, a lot of people say maybe thickened walls, but it looks more like a shelf to me. Uh, but diaphragm, you can see, contains uh, shelves. Otherwise, though, it is solid. Uh, spongy has perforated uh, pith with holes. Excavated just means uh, hollow for the most part. And then chambered pith also has shelves, but otherwise it's primarily excavated or hollow. Um, anyhow, so you have different types of pith, piths, uh, or yeah. And anyway, you can use that sometimes as another telltale sign to try to get it down to species, whatever you're looking at. All right. And then as far as bud scales, I've mentioned this, you know, this is a single bud scale covering, this is American sycamore, Platinus occidentalis. And, um, but anyhow, this has a single bud scale. You would never see the buds of American sycamore in the summertime, unless you take the leaf like off. So if you tear the leaf off very carefully or gently, uh, then that petiole is hiding the bud. Uh, so you can see it's a cone-shaped bud. It's a single scale. It's got some color to it, maybe some reddish uh, and green color to it. And then the other neat thing is that thin petiole, right, has left a very narrow leaf scar that encircles the entire bud. And then with American sycamore, you've got pretty much shiny twigs that are sort of zigzag. They don't have a true terminal bud. It's a pseudo-terminal bud. Uh, so Again, just trying to emphasize that, you know, this terminology is important, but uh, the twig ID can be especially uh, helpful. Then we get into some other buds like this. This is pawpaw, asamina triloba, and uh, pawpaw then. These larger buds that you see, these lateral buds, are actually flower buds. Some people refer to them as fruit buds, uh, but these uh, flower buds are typically larger and uh, rounded and, and quite a bit larger than your typical buds that you would see that just you know is packaged full of leaves, for example. Next up would be glabrous and pubescent. Um, so glabrous just meaning smooth or free of hairs, pubescent meaning hairy or hair is, is usually present. Uh, so you can see on the left side, there's sweet gum. Uh, it has imbricate scales, right? So it has three or more uh, scales there on that terminal bud that you're looking at. And then it looks like it's been polished, real glossy, uh, but typically green and red uh, scales, very glossy in appearance, appears to have been polished. On the right side, uh, this is uh, mockernut hickory, and you can see why it would be called caria uh, tomentosa. It's extremely tomentose, heavily pubescent or hairy, and um, just a, you know, a great example then of pubescence. Now we're going to get into bark a little bit. So um, the outer bark, if you think about it, these are a lot of dead. These are this is the dead wood or dead cells that you're seeing uh, on the outside of a tree. But that forms the armor to protect the trees. All right. So we generally don't want to, uh, you know, hit those with a mower or, or uh, damage trees. You know, when you're doing a log logging operation, because if you get down to that cambium layer, you know, you could potentially uh, injure that tree or, or it may succumb to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, disease or, or insect infestation or something like that. So the bark is very important as far as providing that armor, but it also comes in a variety of, of sizes and, and shapes and colors and textures. Uh, so we'll get into that now. Three categories then that uh, the, the gentleman laid out in his book. I actually like this. I, I don't think he came up with it. Uh, but it is in his book and it's been used for, for many years. Um, but 
you have young bark or, or small trees that are typically young that'll have uh, bark characteristics. And these bark characteristics will change over time because if you have that, that growing wood on the inside, you know, that's causing uh, the bark then to have to expand. And as, and as that bark expands, uh, then it's going to kind of buckle and crack and split and then and change, maybe even drastically over time, like you can see here. So the young bark of a, this is a red maple, Acer rubrum, um, and you can see the smooth gray bark there, but then on a mature tree, hey, it's no longer smooth. Uh, a lot of changes there versus an old, old growth uh, or an older tree, maybe a red maple that's well over 100 years old. Uh, now, all of a sudden, that bark is, is drastically different, even than the mature red maple. So he's got different categories. I, I stuck with those with bark types. Uh, you can see this. Uh, actually, rather than me reading through this list, let me just go through it here. Okay. So the pictures are pictures worth a thousand words. Words in this case, uh, we have drawings. So you got smooth, unbroken, like American beech, peeling horizontally and curly strips, maybe like a river birch or a yellow birch. We have lenticels visible. Uh, notice we have linear lentils on the left. Uh, I always call those horizontal. They look like horizontal lines or horizontal lentils. Very common in things like uh, black cherry. Uh, diamond shaped lentils there in the center. And then round or uh, oval shaped lentils on the right. Again, lentils are just for gas exchange, if I forgot to mention that. So you'll see lentils on the trunk or the bowl of the tree, but you also have lentils then that occur on the twigs. And then we have vertical cracks or seams and otherwise smooth bark. Uh, this is uh, really common in a young forest. A young forest meaning, you know, it's one to 15 years old, for example, and maybe uh, you'll start to see that smooth bark uh, change a little bit. You'll see some uh, seams or vertical cracks in there, um, sometimes caused by lenticels and sometimes not. And then we have scales and plates. Uh, so scales are typically smaller than your hand. All right, everybody get that? So scales are typically smaller than your hand. Um, and I guess, you know, a good example of, of that would be a large, uh, maybe mature black cherry, for example, has scales um, or scaly bark. Looks a lot like corn flakes, about the same size as corn flakes out of the box and as if somebody glued them to a tree. And then we have plates. Plates are typically the size of your hand or larger. Um, and we'll see some species here in a minute that do have uh, platy bark. Then you get with uh, another category, vertical strips. Uh, so again, this is just how we do things, trying to learn, categorize things, getting it down to you know, a more specific uh, uh, or down to maybe a species level. So vertical strips. I think a good example of this, just based on the drawing, hey, maybe it's a white oak, Quercus alba, right? Vertical strips. And then we have ridges and furrows. So on the left, you see they're intersecting, I hope, kind of like a, a fisherman's net. So intersecting ridges and furrows. Then we have in the middle broken horizontally. So they're more straight up and down, but you got these cracks and stuff and you can see them then broken horizontally. And then we have uninterrupted ridges, almost look more like uh, wavy lines. So tree ID is really just a process of elimination. Y'all probably already know this. Maybe some of you are very experienced and you're disappointed, like, man, Chris, you know, I was really hoping we'd get into the meat of this. Well, that's where the maybe the part two could come in. Uh, but I'll, I'll continue to move on. Uh, but I'm just trying to walk you through, again, these steps that you should always take or, or we at least recommend that you take. But if you think about a dichotomous key, again, the hard part's the terminology. It's like a roadmap. You either turn right or left. If you turn right and you should have gone left, you're going to get lost. You're going to be upset, kind of mad about it, that you wasted that much of your time uh, to get to a point, you know, where you just, it was incorrect. So you made an error. So I highly recommend before you tackle keys, look up the uh, important terminology there so that you can get to where you need to go. As far as uh, conifers versus broadleaf plants, I think y'all probably uh, would know the difference. But, you know, if you think about conifers, we're talking about pines, spruce, fir, hemlock, um, you know, cedar, things like that. Broadleaf plants, we 
you think about a lot of our deciduous trees, especially your maples, your oaks, your hickories, your elms, so on and so forth. And then know too that, you know, as far as deciduous goes and evergreen, you know, that may be a good starting point, but that can be dangerous. So bald cypress, for example, is a, it's a conifer, uh, but it's deciduous. So it's a deciduous conifer. Um, and then as far as, um, you know, evergreen, you think, well, that's all the pines and spruce and all those. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but Southern Magnolia, for example, is a, is a, uh, you know, a, a tree that you generally would think, oh, okay, hang on a second. What is that exactly? Uh, it's just a broadleaf evergreen. Um, so, you know, there are some exceptions to the rule, but always think about where you're starting. And usually your starting point is going to be, you know, very broad, like angiosperms, gymnosperms, getting down to conifer, broadleaf, uh, so on and so forth. I've got over here on the left, mad buck plus verbine, verbine uh, sorry, viburnums. Um, MAD stands for, and these are all the oppositely arranged trees and shrubs that we run into most of the time. Uh, there are some exceptions to this, but for the most part, especially when we're dealing with uh, plants that are native to our particular region, uh, you know, this pretty much encompasses most of those. So MAD would be your maples, all right? A for ash, D for dogwood, so maple, ash, dogwood, MAD. And then B, buckeyes, all right, so buck would be your buckeyes. And then uh, the viburnums, uh, used to be in Caprifoliaceae, but, you know, all these really cool shrubs that have a lot of ecological value, these viburnums, they too are opposite. Uh, so I recommend you be a detective, you know, this is pretty important. Uh, when I was growing up, a little, you know, as a little kid in kindergarten, kids would run around, you know, look up, look down, look all around, and they'd say, oh, your pants are falling down. Uh, but, you know, I know that's maybe not appropriate, but anyway, it, it does, you know, as far as tree ID makes me think back like, okay, I need to be thorough here as far as looking up, look down, look all around, be a detective. And, uh, and I think if you uh, find enough, um, you know, as far as parts of the tree during the winter time, you see everything with your binoculars, you get some things in the hand, you're using all your senses, then you should be able to get it down to species. All right, here we go with the good stuff. I've got to hurry. Uh, so <clears throat> this is yellow poplar, Liriodendron tulipifera. It's a magnolia so it's in the magnolia family. Uh, just an awesome tree, but this is it. You know, a lot of, these are the parts that maybe you need to identify. So first, what are the site conditions, right? So yellow poplar is going to be found on these cool, moist sites for the most part. Somewhat of a site generalist, but you know, because of fire suppression, we have yellow poplar in places where it did not naturally occur when fire was a very um, important part or, or actually a uh, you know, frequent part of, of the landscape here in the eastern United States. We're starting to apply fire more on a landscape scale, but, but not enough. So fire suppression, for example, uh, has had an impact on where some of these species occur now. Uh, but typically, this would have been relegated to maybe those north uh, facing slopes, uh, moist coves uh, along the water, you know, real rich sites, uh, so on and so forth. But this is what we have. We've got bark ID. Think about growth form, though. So yellow poplar, for example, has that column-like growth form, like the columns on the front of a house. So it really doesn't taper much. So 30, 40 feet up, you know, it's almost the same diameter uh, 30 feet up as it is at breast height. So it's got that column-like growth, and you might be able to see that here in this picture. Uh, then if you're looking up and you've got your binoculars, you might be able to see some seed pods that are still hanging on, maybe even in February. Uh, and then if you're looking on the ground, uh, you might actually see some poplar leaves, which look a lot like a cat's face. So you're looking for a really unique leaf. And, um, you know, although there's a maybe a wide variety of species there, <laughs> this can be helpful kind of looking through the leaves. And then the seeds that are laying on the ground, uh, as you can see in that lower right. But then, you know, this is a challenge. We talk, uh, I talked about how twigs are very useful, uh, but twigs can be uh, difficult to come by if you don't have regeneration. So if you don't have young trees out there, you know, where you can reach and get to a twig and you're looking at a poplar that's, you know, 100 feet tall or so, uh, it's going to be difficult to climb that tree and, and get some twigs. 
So you might be able to see twig characteristics with binoculars, but if you can get your hands on the twigs, you know, that's, uh, that's definitely an added bonus and you should not miss that tree. Uh, you can see with poplar it has valvate scales, that means two scales. And because of the, the uh, that scales being valvate and also the shape and everything, they look like a duck's bill. So the terminal bud on the yellow poplar look a lot like a, uh, a duck's bill. It's almost a dead giveaway, like, oh, okay, I've got a poplar. But to add to that, you have these raised lenticels, uh, not lenticels, I'm sorry. You have these raised leaf scars that look a lot like little miniature moon craters. And then all up and down the twig, it's in the magnolia family. So magnoliaceae, they'll have these stipules in the summer and then during the, the fall and winter months, you'll have stipules scars. So you, it looks like little rings in around the twig uh, where those, uh, because of those stipule scars. All right. So real quick, I've just got a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to kind of walk you through kind of what we do uh, with class, especially as we identify, you know, where are we? So if you think about forest cover types, let's say high dry site here in the Ridge and Valley Physiographic Province. We're getting up in elevation a little bit out of the river valley. Again, it's it's kind of dry, a lot of sun exposure. We might run into something like the chestnut oak. Um, and then chestnut oak will have these tall ridges, these deep furrows. If you look inside those furrows, you know, you'll actually see what appears to be like an orange or sometimes green, but more typically an orange stripe there inside the furrows. Real chunky bark. Um, and and um, anyway, it's it's pretty unique. Uh, not much else will have bark that looks like uh, chestnut oak. And then if we look around for leaves, maybe you'll see those leaves with a wavy margin, right? And we know it's a white oak or it's in the white oak group, not the red oak group, because you don't have any bristles on the tips of the leaves, right? On the, uh, the ends of those lobes. Uh, so again, unique leaf. If you can find some of those, that's going to be a bonus. And then when we get into twig characteristics, you can see these terminal buds. So oaks will have clustered terminal buds, okay? And uh, always keep that in mind. So but again, oak trees, uh, these Quercus species, Phagaceae is a family, they'll have what we call clustered terminal buds. And really what it is, is there are a lot of buds on the terminal end of the twig. Uh, but you can see them here, chestnut oak, extremely unique. So sharp pointed, um, got orange or chestnut brown scales. They're globrous, they're not hairy, um, and fairly long for, for buds. So skinny, long, sharp pointed, and again, globrous with those chestnut brown or orange scales. And then keep looking. So if you keep looking, you will see then, hopefully maybe find some uh, acorns. So acorn, if you're from Tennessee, acorn, if you're from elsewhere, uh, but I'm always looking for acorns. And uh, when you see these chestnut oak acorns, they tend to be the largest ones in the woods where they occur. Uh, they're fairly uh, long. You can see about an inch and a half. And then they've got a very thin cap. And that cap covers a little bit more than a third of the nut. But it's a shiny nut. It's globrous. It's not pubescent or hairy. And then that thin cap. Um, another thing I've learned about chestnut oak, we do a lot of seed ID. And I would like to do that maybe some more if we have a part two of this. Um, is if you bring them inside, they kind of shrivel up like a raisin. Uh, a lot of the other oak acorns won't do that, but chestnut oak will. Okay, I think that's about all the time that I have. Um, and, and again, I would like to go into more detail about, uh, you know, the species ID and really start to do some groupings. Um, very quickly, I'll show you kind of the grouping that I have here. So chestnut oak, you got to think, hey, what are the friends, you know, who are friends out here? So some of these trees, you know, they're friends with each other. And some of them are kind of outcasts. They, they don't belong there, right? Naturally, they should not be occurring within that vegetation type or that forest cover type. So think about that. That's going to be very helpful. And that's where that SAF book comes in handy. So, you know, on a, on a better site, you know, with chestnut oak, um, you might see another associate being black oak. All right. And I'm going to quickly just show you this and then I'm done. Southern red oak, another one that may be out there in the woods uh, with those two species. We've got scarlet oak. I, I would love to talk more about these and I can later. 
if you all want to do that. Um, and then get into more depth too. Northern red oak, how do you tell the difference in northern red and scarlet oak, right? So they both have these ski tracks or appear like ski slopes, the bark, uh, but northern red oak, the, the tracks or the ski slopes go pretty much all the way down to your shins, maybe knees. And then scarlet oak will have sort of corky bark at the base, typically your bigger scarlet oaks. So the ski tracks will generally stop at about breast height. So there's a lot of things that we're looking at, right, to try to, to sort these things out and separate things. Uh, so yeah, I'll stop there and um, take any questions you might have. And I know you all need to do some other things as far as housekeeping. Thank you for your time. I hope uh, if you've listened to this during your lunch break, maybe you learned something, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity and I'm, I'm honored to do this. Can you expand some on leaf marcetta, such as with American beech? What is the fault behind why some species have a stronger leaf marcetta than others? Oh, okay. I, I think you said marcescence. So that's when uh, leaves persist into the winter months. It's very common on American beach. Uh, we see it on campus here with sawtooth oak. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, that, that can be a very helpful um, uh, characteristic as far as winter tree identification. So, and I can go into a lot of details or, or more detail about marcescence, you know, in part two. Uh, another question, what is the evolutionary advantage to the stipulus? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that one. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody heard that, but yeah, the evolutionary advantage of uh, having stipules. I know sometimes there are some species where stipules develop into spines, um, but it's, I would assume it's, and I may be way off here, I'm, I'm going to take a, a guess, but have to do with photosynthesis, maximizing photosynthesis during the growing season uh, by having more uh, leaf-like structures there uh, that can help um, these trees, you know, that are uh, sugar factories. Uh, another question, are there different species of black oak? Um, <laughs> yeah, y'all have great questions. So, uh, you know, you'll hear people fight over oak trees a little bit. You know, we tend to be a, an odd group of, of folks. So there will be some debate going on as far as is this a hybrid, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but black oak, Quercus uh, velutina, that's the way we teach it. We don't teach that there's a, a subspecies or anything of black oak. Um, what was the name of the first book reference that you used when in college? Um, the name of the book? Yes. I think that's the Forest Cover Types book. Uh, Forest Cover Types of the United States and Canada. Um, maybe. Uh, Chris, let me chime in. Can we add, put your PowerPoint presentation or a PDF of it, make that available to folks where they could look up some of these details, references? Yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And Katie, how would we do that? We can, I believe we can probably link to it on our website. Um, what I can do is after I upload the Zoom video, we can also provide a link to it. Yeah, Neil, I, I don't know. Uh, seems like there's a little bit of interest in doing a part two and getting into some more details as far as um, you know, identification and, and, and maybe doing some groupings and stuff and trying to help folks with uh, in that area a little bit more specifically. Yeah, well, Chris, I apologize that we put you in an impossible situation of covering this topic in 45 minutes and, and appreciate your graciousness to offer a part two. So uh, we're all on board here of doing that. Uh, and, uh, I, and I've seen all the comments requesting that that we add a second part to this. May have to add a part three just to handle the questions that come in, <laughs> but definitely a part two. And uh, Katie, if the, you and Chris and I can get together and put something together and plan it, we will send that out to everyone that's still in attendance. Chris, uh, it was top notch. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a list of notes here 
that I wrote down. Um, with with tree ID and dendrology, it's a lifelong learning pursuit. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, it's when I'm around people like uh, uh, John Palmer. He's in North Carolina. He's a UT grad. He went to NC State for undergrad and finished his master's at UT in the seventies. Uh, but I'm around John Palmer uh, a bit, and then Ron Lance. You know, people like that. Uh, you realize you're like, man. I've got, I still got a lot to learn, uh, but you always uh, recommend people lean on folks like that uh, because, you know, it's, uh, if if you don't use it, you lose it. I know you, you know that, Neil, but um, it's, it's very true. Uh, so I've, I guess, fortunately for me, teaching dendrology in the spring semester has allowed me to, it's like working with old friends, um, getting to a point where, you know, I can, see these twigs from a distance and <laughs> I already know what they are for the most part, but it's, uh, it, it started out being extremely challenging, but it's become, uh, you know, very rewarding and the students enjoy it. Yeah, it is uh, very fulfilling. And we have business people here. It helps their credibility with clients. And I see some faces from volunteers that know twice as much about tree ID than I do that are just passionate about it. And it's really a diverse group of folks that, that get into this and uh, I, I find it very rewarding. Okay, just uh, want to let no, folks know that we're lining up the schedule for this year and our next one's going to be on February 16th, a little bit different. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, people that participate in a national study of 15 cities to determine the extent of heat island effects in uh, 15 U.S. cities. And also, they did an assessment of the impact on public health and other uh, uh, results of the uh, increased temperature. And I will say that one of the findings they found was that our cities tend to be 15 to 20 degrees warmer than the surrounding greenscapes, which is an obvious uh, point for many of us that part of the solution to the urban heat islands in our cities and with the public improvement in public health and other issues is to plant more trees and have more green spaces. So we're gonna hear from the leader of that study and also two participants in Tennessee, the two cities that participated in Nashville and Knoxville to give us a firsthand look of their study and some of the steps they're gonna to take to address urban heat islands uh, in, 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 uh, in Tennessee. So if you're living in a city, this is an issue that affects you and you might learn something that can help you advocate for more trees and more green spaces in your community. So hope you can attend on February the 16th. All right, now the last slide. Uh, everybody here, judging from the ISA points, is familiar with the International Society of Boriculture. Mo many of you are in the Southern chapter, I am. They're having their annual meeting in Chattanooga, Tennessee on March 26 to 28. I hope you will be there. It's the best professional organization I've uh, participate in as far as my urban forestry career. Uh, they need volunteers. It's volunteer based and uh, it's an opportunity for you to volunteer and to help out either with the tree climbing championship or with the conference itself from registration to stuffing bags. They need help. So I hope that you will attend the conference and I hope that you will volunteer your time and your talents. There is a link there. Uh, you can't click it from your screen, but I'm just going to give you a second to jot it down if you're interested. If not, go to the ISA Southern Chapter webpage, and you can find more information on this uh, excellent conference. Hope to see you there. So with that, we're going to bring this to a close. I want to thank everybody who attended uh, that set through uh, to the end, and, and I know we all learned a lot, and Chris, uh, and we're going to get kind of wet their appetite for a, a part two. So go ahead and start preparing your presentation and we'll give out those details soon. But thank you for attending.